Good morning. The first item of business is general questions, and we start with question number one, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its strategy is for tackling mental health issues in rural areas. Minister Clare Hockey. Through the Mental Health Strategy 2017 to 2027, Action 12 outlines our commitment to supporting the development of the National Rural Mental Health Forum. The forum was established in 2017 and through Scottish Government funding helps people in rural areas maintain good mental health and well-being. The forum also develops connections between communities across rural Scotland to reflect the unique challenges presented excuse me, by rural isolation. Membership has grown from 16 to over 60 organisations, with the forum meeting quarterly to discuss outcomes such as how people in rural communities can overcome barriers to accessing and seeking mental health support. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Minister for that encouraging answer. Um, and I welcome Action Point 12. Um, the forum's membership is indeed evidence of demand and need and is making a real difference in tackling mental ill health in the unique context of rural Scotland where deprivation is hidden and around one million Scots live. Uh, I held an event for local employers recently in my region to highlight the, um, the support and help that the forum can give. And will the Minister continue to work with the Forum throughout the lifetime of this Government's mental health strategy? Minister. Well, it, government funding for the Forum covers the financial year 2018-19 to and the 2019-20 spending review process is ongoing. I certainly recognise the work of the Forum under the chair of Jim Hume. I think he, they have done um, some fantastic work and they're, they're now the National Network for Driving Change Rurally. Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Um, I, the Minister will be aware of the closure of two wards at the Royal Cornhill Hospital in, in Aberdeenshire. Um, this is uh, giving rise to concerns in my own constituency about the capacities for dealing with patients for Orkney. Would you be um, able to investigate the, those concerns uh, and provide some reassurances that there will indeed be the capacity to meet the needs of patients uh, from the island? Minister. Uh, I'd like to assure the member that certainly the Scottish Government is aware of uh, the ward closures and is working closely with NHS Grampian um, to ensure that there is capacity. However, if he would like to write to me with his specific concerns, I'd certainly be able to look into that and come back to him. Annie Wills. Thank you. Levels of depression in the agricultural sector are thought to be increasing at, to be increasing in suicide rates in farmers are amongst the highest in any occupational group. It is understood that one agricultural worker a week takes their own life in the UK. What support is being offered to farmers and agricultural workers specifically when it comes to rural mental health? Minister. Well, so I've already answered my previous question to Claudia Beamish. There's the National Rural Mental Health Forum, which is certainly doing a lot of work with farmers and the farming community. Uh, I would expect that uh, that work will continue. Um, we have the National Suicide Prevention Action Plan, which will look at uh, suicide, uh, uh, suicide prevention measures across the country. And uh, they will also be looking, obviously, at uh, specific occupations and um, reviewing suicides to see if there's lessons that we can learn there to prevent further suicides. And Neil Finlay. Um, people in rural and urban areas in my region uh, increasingly tell me that they can only access services when they're in desperation and when they're really in a crisis. So what does the minister advise me to tell people who come to me seeking help but can't get it? Minister. Um, this government prioritises uh, mental health and I think that's evidenced by the increased uh, spending over the last few years, we spent a billion pounds in mental health in 2017 to 18. I would encourage anyone who is in mental health crisis to approach their primary care team and to seek help there. There are also uh, online um, on, um, telephone services that, that people in crisis can use via NHS 24 and breathing space. Thank you. Question number two, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what action it is taking to tackle sectarianism. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. We continue to work towards a sectarian free Scotland by supporting a wide range of activity in formal and informal settings. This includes supporting work for organisations like Nil by Mouth, Sense Over Sectarianism and Supporters Direct Scotland, and the delivery of Scotland's first national education resource for tackling sectarianism, which is freely available to all. 
This work, of course, builds on a record investment of 13. 0.5 million over the past six years, which supported 120 projects to, to, to deliver anti-sectarian education and activity across Scotland. We continue to see a positive impact in the communities that are benefiting from this work. James Dornan. Thank you. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary will, may be aware that on Tuesday evening last week I convened the first meeting of the cross-party group on combating sectarianism in Scottish society. And it was great to be joined by a number of fellow MSPs from the SNP, Scottish Conservatives and the Greens, as well as external members like the Church of Scotland, No By Mouth, Scottish Women's Convention, West of Scotland Regional Equality Council and others. I'm encouraged by the work of the Scottish Government in, in addressing sectarianism and welcome last week's publication of their final report on the legal definition of sectarianism. But will the, uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the only way we will finally end sectarianism is as, as a society working together and will he commit to working with the cross-party group in the future? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I will, of course, commit to, to work with CPG uh, in the future. Can I just take a moment to put on record uh, the, the outstanding work that James Dornan has personally done in relation to tackling uh, sectarianism? He has taken, uh, for any of us that are on social media, if nothing else, has taken a, a, a huge amount uh, of personal abuse uh, for doing so, for standing up uh, to sectarianism uh, in Scotland. He should be commended uh, for that, and he's done that uh, and, and dealt with it uh, with, with huge amounts of dignity uh, as well. I'm really pleased that he's convened that cross-party group. I'm pleased to see that there, are, uh, there is a cross-party consensus uh, that we have to, of course, tackle this problem. And hopefully James Dornan and, and the group will get to the point of how is best to tackle this problem. And we of the government will work closely with them on that. We are, of course, working on legislation in terms of hate crime that will look at sectarianism. We'll look at whether or not uh, to, to, to bring forward a statutory aggravator on sectarian prejudice. We'll keep an open mind uh, to that as the consultation is cu currently underway. But wherever we can assist in relation to the law, but also, as he rightly points out, in terms of education, uh, then uh, I will be willing to, to, to look at any good ideas that come forward from the CPG or indeed from across the chamber. Question number three, Donald Cameron. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to improve access to air transport for disabled people who wish to travel to and from island communities. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, we continue to make airports across the Highlands and Islands accessible to people with reduced mobility through our subsidy of Highlands and Islands Airports Limited. HIAL and their airline customers provide services and equipment to enable people with reduced mobility to access air services. HIAL continually reviews its service provision to ensure that barriers to travel for people with reduced mobility are removed as far as possible. Donald Cameron. Well, can I thank you for that answer and draw his attention to the case of Fiona McKinnon, a resident of Tyree who suffers from two serious health conditions, one of which requires her to fly to Glasgow to attend regular appointments at the Beetson. Due to her fluctuating weight, which comes as a result of her medication, she is sometimes deemed ineligible to fly. What action can the Cabinet Secretary take to ensure that Fiona can travel with dignity and to ensure that others in her situation can do so too? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I understand that High have been engaged in this particular in issue and, uh, with this particular uh, individual in making flights to uh, Glasgow and the most uh, up-to-date information I have regarding uh, this particular issue is that the matter has been resolved uh, by High and the equipment which they have in Tyree to help to support this woman to make access to air services as and when is necessary. However, if the member would find it helpful, uh, I'm more than happy for High Al to contact him to provide further details on that uh, to give assurances to his constituent on this matter. Question number four, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will rule out the delivery of personal independence payments and disability living allowance by the DWP under agency arrangements. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. People who rely on disability benefits have consistently told us that what matters most to them is that they are paid the right amount of money on time. So the most important consideration will be to ensure a safe and secure transition of these benefits from the DWP. The timetable and delivery schedule for disability benefits will be announced in the, the next year. Mark Griffin. I note the Cabinet Secretary's answer and reminder that disabled people are desperately keen to know how and when their benefits will be fully deliver, delivered by Scotland's new social security system. They want an end to the DWP's entire involvement in their disability benefits. Now, for carers, government has agreed that the DWP should continue delivering carers allowance for the next two years with no changes to earning thresholds or study restrictions and payments and debts collected under Tory rules. I don't think 
that would be acceptable um, for disability benefits. And can the Cabinet Secretary confirm today um, there will be no DWP involvement in disability benefits? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I do appreciate um, Mark Griffin's uh, challenge to the government to do more and to, to do it faster. I think that's certainly something which I myself, as the Cabinet Secretary, bear very much in mind when I work through the programme for this. But I'm also conscious that members quite rightly tell me, tell the government to learn lessons from past public sector programmes where we have taken things, or particularly around uh, universal credit, the UK government has taken things um, in an ill-advised fashion and um, at not the correct speed. So I'm conscious that we do, when we're delivering this programme, which is a joint programme with the DWP, have to have a realistic timetable and delivery mechanisms in place, and they will be announced uh, next year, as I said. The pace will be quick um, around this. The Social Security Act was only passed earlier uh, this year, uh, and the overriding priority must and always will be safe and secure transition. The member raised carers' uh, allowance supplement and the decisions we've taken around that. That was specifically done to ensure that we got money directly into the uh, carers who have the lowest income to ensure that that money was given to them um, quickly. That is the first step on a journey for the Scottish Government looking at carers and looking very seriously at issues in the future. And Stuart Stevenson. Uh, can the Government confirm that it is the SNP Government who will maintain disability benefits, not cut them, will ensure they remain universal? not means tested, will reform the disability benefit assessment process to ensure they work for service users and that disability assessments will be carried out by the public sector in Social Security Scotland. Well, the member is quite right to point to um, all those commitments that the government has made. We are committed to maintaining the level of disability benefits paid to individuals and indeed to raise them annually by at least the rate of inflation. Protecting disability assistance also by ensuring that benefits continue to be non-means tested. We're involving people who receive those benefits in the design of our dis disability benefit system process. And that's why I know they want to ensure that the assessments are undertaken in-house by the Social Security Agency, um, ensuring that the DWP and indeed private sector agencies uh, will no longer be involved in the assessment process. Thank you. Question number five, Monica Lennon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport last met the Chief Executive and Chair of NHS Lanarkshire and what was discussed. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. <clears throat> Both Ministers and Scottish Government officials meet regularly with the leadership of all our NHS boards, including NHS Lanarkshire, uh, to discuss a range of matters. I chaired NHS Lanarkshire's annual review at the University Hospital in Haymires on Friday the 2nd of November and went through a number of matters with both the Chair and Chief Exec at that time. Monica Lennon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply. Cole Thompson from East Kilbride is six years old. His mum, Lisa Quarrell, is desperately trying to find a cure for the crippling epileptic seizures that leave Cole paralysed and unable to speak. So far, Cole has not been prescribed the medicinal cannabis that could greatly help his condition. Cole has touched the hearts of thousands of people already and a petition led by East Kilbride Community Trust is pushing for urgent action. Time is not on Cole's side. Will the Cabinet Secretary do everything she can to ensure that Cole gets the medicine that he needs? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, Ms Lennon for uh, her supplementary question and I absolutely understand the issues that she is raising and uh, the distress and uh, upset that is caused uh, to the family. Um, the issue around uh, the prescribing of medicinal cannabis is, of course, uh, rests on the regulatory changes from the UK government. They came into effect on the 1st of November, and we issued uh, guidance to uh, our health boards and practitioners uh, very quickly uh, at that time. Uh, I am happy to look further at this case uh, and to uh, speak with the member concerned around the particular questions that it raises uh, and to see what further we can do uh, as a Scottish Government and as a health service to assist in this matter. Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. In your discussions with NHS Lanarkshire Cabinet Secretary, can, you, uh, can I welcome your decision to review the proposed new 
Monklands Hospital consultation resites. Can you advise the Chamber when, how long this review will take? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful uh, for that supplementary question and indeed uh, for the support for the decision that I took to review uh, the process uh, of identifying uh, the options that should then be consulted on. And it is important that I make clear to the Chamber that I have expressed absolutely no uh, opinion on the location. I have made it clear to the Board and to uh, I hope to the uh, residents of the area concerned that this government supports a replacement for the current Mon Monklands Hospital. The issue that is being reviewed is the manner in which uh, the choices of uh, alternative locations uh, are, uh, are reached, the manner in which those choices are taken, and the manner in which the consultation is held in order to ensure that the maximum number of voices uh, are uh, heard before the board reaches a view on the recommendations it wishes to make to me for my decision. Uh, so that review, um, we are finalising now the, the specific terms of that and who will lead it, uh, and I hope to be able to announce that very shortly. The review, I expect to take a relatively short yeah. period of time because that is what it's looking at, and I am very conscious that we want, uh, we and indeed the board, and I'm sure the residents of the area want uh, to move relatively quickly here uh, to reach uh, a fully informed and genuinely considered and publicly consulted uh, view on where should be the best location, uh, the recommendations made to me for the best location for the new uh, replacement hospital for Monklands. And I will announce that shortly in terms of the review's uh, personnel, its remit and its timetable. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In NHS Lanarkshire, the absenteeism rate has climbed for the fourth year in a row uh, from 4.7% to 5.7% against the Scottish Government target of 4% a target that the SNP has never achieved. A rising workload due to staff shortages plays a huge part in this. The Cabinet Secretary recently announced an extra 2,600 nurse and midwifery places, which is, although very welcome, does not even cover the posts that are currently vacant. So does the Cabinet Secretary recognise that the workforce planning still falls short of what our NHS requires? Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> For the eighth year in a row, I announced very recently an increase in nursing and midwifery places. Uh, I also announced the continuation of the return to practice programme, very successful practice uh, programme for uh, nurses returning uh, to practice after some absence, and an increase in the pre-registration work that Open University Scotland undertakes. Again, another very successful programme. So we are working in terms of uh, nursing and midwifery places to ensure that we are uh, maintaining the increase in recruitment that is absolutely necessary. We are doing exactly the same thing in terms of medical undergraduates, looking also at advanced uh, um, uh, allied health professions and a really important area of work and again looking to ensure that we are recruiting and training uh, in a range of different ways in order to, to widen access across all of those professions. Um, we, our workforce plan uh, is one that is based on the best evidence that we have available. It is a plan that continues to be uh, refined as that evidence improves. Our safe staffing bill, which is currently uh, the subject of discussion here in this parliament, about to uh, get to its stage one uh, decision making, uh, will assist us in providing further robust uh, evidence in terms of uh, our workforce planning. So I do not accept uh, Mr Whittle's uh, assertion and I would make the point that it is this government in this uh, country that has the most advanced workforce planning uh, across the UK and perhaps he could take some lessons uh, on how we are doing matters further south. Question number six, Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reports that in 13 locations in Aberdeen have illegal levels of nitrogen dioxide pollution. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Aberdeen City Council has produced an action plan containing a number of measures to improve air quality. The Scottish Government is working closely with the Council as it implements the measures contained in the plan and is providing practical and financial assistance to both monitor air quality and support delivery of measures. And as announced in the 2017-18 programme for government, the Council will establish a low emission zone in Aberdeen by 2020. Tom Mason. May I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? 
can I also remind colleagues that I am a city Aberdeen city councillor. I know the cabinet secretary will be as worried as I am at these reports in the press and journal, given the potential deadly consequences of this level of pollution, which in some areas is as high as 48 micrograms of gas per cubic metre, well above the EAQD limit of 40. And according to research by the British Lung Foundation, one of the worst affected streets in the city, of, in the city King Street, is home to the Aberdeen Community Health and Care Village, forcing patients to breathe this toxic air on the way to receive medical treatment. Can I ask, therefore, that what consideration the Scottish Government has given, either itself or through SEPA, to making additional support available to local authority, so that they can take action against this now, rather than simply waiting for the low admission zone in 2020? Cabinet Secretary. Well, well, as I indicated, the, uh, the Government is already uh, um, uh, discussing with the local authority uh, and has uh, um, provided uh, uh, funding uh, over a number of years to, to do the kind of work that is necessary. Uh, I agree uh, with the member that uh, when we see results like this, it is a real, it is a real concern and there are definitely, in, uh, particularly in urban areas, a number of very particular hotspots which uh, uh, create some, uh, uh, some significant difficulties. But uh, work is uh, ongoing with Aberdeen and there are uh, a number of things being taken to improve air quality. I indicated the air quality report already. Uh, we know that the uh, uh, AWPR will make a significant difference to air quality in Aberdeen. Um, and there is a further citywide traffic count being proposed uh, following the opening of the AWPR. So there is work uh, going on. Uh, and uh, of course, there is an independently led review of the Clean Air for Scotland uh, um, that I've only just announced. Uh, which will be uh, taking place and uh, I hope for input from all uh, to that um, but equally we keep an eye on some of the specific problems and as I indicated speak directly to local councils about that.